And this is Ken Kratzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. We are covering Army football. We have a chance today to talk to an alumnus of the U.S. Military Academy, a veteran of the United States Army, and that is Steve. Hey, Steve, how are you tonight? Good to talk. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Steve, uh, as we uh, had a chance to meet. You guys do a fan page for West Point and uh, a couple of alumni, and you're in the Huntsville, Alabama area. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, the, the genesis of it uh, dates back about 10 years and actually began as a uh, radio broadcast, which is still going on through uh, the local ESPN affiliate here in Huntsville, Alabama. But yeah, 10 years ago, myself and two other uh, grads, uh, Bill Crawford, who is the crawdad of our Facebook page and our uh, show's name, and Tom Economy, and uh, those uh, 81 and 80 uh, grad there. And um, just out of our love for Army football, decided to get together. Bill pitched it to the local station, and uh, we were off and running, and uh, we're coming into our 10th season. Uh, started a Facebook page uh, a year later, but really hadn't really focused on that until the last couple of years. Well, you're down in the Huntsville, Alabama area, an area where there's a lot of Army veterans, a lot of Army activity. Uh, you mentioned the, Hut the Redstone Arsenal uh, right there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about about the uh, about the Army operations uh, uh, right there in your area in Huntsville, Alabama? Yeah, very, very large uh, Army presence. We actually have a four-star command here, Army Material Command, and uh, so all you know that trickles down from there. So uh, yeah, large, large population, not only Army in general, but West Point graduates. Uh, in particular, uh, there, this is the second largest concentration of West Point graduates in the country. And you know, when you say Huntsville, Alabama, a, a lot of times people have never even heard of that. Uh, but this area has its genesis back in the uh, the space program, Werner von Braun, yeah. um, and th those scientists that did the initial Gemini Mercury programs, and even transitioning into the Apollo program. All of that was done primarily uh, here in Huntsville, Alabama, especially a lot of the engineering and the design work and, and those kind of things. Yeah, and uh, the Saturn V, uh, the, the most powerful rocket ever built, uh, designed there in Huntsville and that, that amazing uh, uh, period of time. And tell us a little bit about your company. Uh, you're working with, uh, you're a deputy director at SAIC, which is a defense aviation Infotech and biomedical company, as I understand it. Tell us a little bit about your company. Yes. Well, I uh, hired on with SCIC right after I transitioned out of the military after 20 uh, plus years uh, in the Army. And it was just a, it was a good fit for me. Uh, got to draw upon a lot of my program management skills uh, and that and, and my aviation background, uh, which was uh, which was fun. And right now, um, it involved in a in flight simulators it's it's a joint military uh, government uh, slash industry um, enterprise that takes everything from a blank sheet of paper to putting out uh, high fidelity multi-million dollar flight simulators uh, primarily for army aviators so it's uh, get to stay stay in touch with my roots which I which I love very good now where what part of the country are you originally from I'm originally from North Texas. I, I was actually an, an Air Force brat, uh, sort of grew up all over. Uh, my parents were originally from a, a small town, Weatherford, Texas, just west of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that's where we spent our summers. Once I got it to be a teenager, I would uh, spend my summers there working for my grandfather, working cattle, hauling hay. And that, so that's been home. Uh, and so unlike a lot of military brats, I actually had a place in the country that was sort of long-term home, home uh, with a nomadic lifestyle that uh, is often a part of uh, growing up in the military. Yeah, now tell us, now what drew you to uh, uh, the Army at West Point and what was it like when you were there in the early 80s? Yeah, well, I, I uh, with my dad being in the Air Force, was originally gravitated toward there, but the main thing, I, I just really had a passion for uh, flying and that's something what I, uh, and so I found out that you could do that in the Army. Uh, that that sort of put it on the radar, pursued a, a nomination to the military academy. Uh, Senator Phil Graham was kind enough to give me one. And uh, uh, during the early 80s, was really a transition time, uh, I think, at the military academy. We were coming out of the 
the Vietnam era. Matter of fact, most of the professors there at the time were Vietnam vets uh, transitioning, you know, out of a, uh, you know, the, the draft and back to a full volunteer force and that. Uh, but it was just, uh, you know, I don't know what I expected during my time at the, uh, the academy, but it, uh, uh, it, it's, it's time that I wouldn't trade for anything in my life the way it shaped me. Uh, to the man that I am today and uh, provided opportunities that I just uh, are, are innumerable. So now aviation, now you, you bring up an interesting question. Uh, you know, when you study West Point and I, I had two uncles who attended West Point in the late 1930s, uh, uh, the cadets there often, uh, you heard about them uh, going, taking flying lessons. They were learning up at, I guess, Stewart Airfield, you know, how to fly the big planes that would be you know flown in world war ii and then with the creation of the air force in in uh, the late 1940s uh fixed wind was separated from the army uh, and given to the air force but helicopters uh remain tell us a little bit about the history of that uh you know i i, I was such a, that must have been quite a shift for the army when they lost uh, uh fixed ring of uh, uh fixed wing flying oh certainly now just to clarify there's still a lot of fixed wing aircraft uh, within the military, but the only combat aircraft are more of the surveillance type aircraft, which are few and far between, but a majority of the fixed wing that the Army has is primarily uh, utility cargo and uh, VIP kind of, kind of missions. A bulk, a vast bulk of Army aviation is uh, all rotary wing. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it changed things. A lot of things that happened organically between the ground maneuver and the air maneuver uh, when that was all under a, a single uh, branch of the military, um, you know, that that happened naturally. And so there were a lot of growing pains, I think, in that. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's interesting now as the Air Force now spins off something, you know, the, the, the new Space Command, uh, Space Forces, uh, they're sort of experiencing that on, on their own uh, with the uh, sort of the little bit of the division, even though I think all that's going to fall under the Department of the Air Force. Um, but yeah, great, great. Uh, I had a chance to train quite a few times with the Air Force, uh, doing back in the day what they call joint air attack teams, where A-10s attack helicopters, both uh, dating back to Cobras, to the newer Apaches. Um, so uh, we always had a great time together. So that, that, that connection is still there. Great. And uh, tell us about uh, what kind of what kind of helicopters uh, did you fly, and uh, wh wh where did where where were some of the bases that uh, that you served at? Okay. Yeah, a, a lot of the you know, it's, it's sad now. Uh, date, dating myself, feeling my age. Uh, most of the time, uh, most of the aircraft that I flew are no longer in the inventory. Back the old uh, OH-58, which is the uh, military equivalent of the uh, Bell Jet Ranger. And then uh, the Cobra, the H1 Cobra, or bulk of my time, also flew the Huey. Um, but I had the privilege of, of finishing out my time in the Apache. Well, that, that's terrific. Uh, tell us a little bit about one of the questions we ask veterans all the time and help uh, you know current veterans is making the transition from the military to civilian life and civilian opportunities. Uh, you seem to make a pretty smooth transition into industry, going to a high tech. Uh, a defense oriented company. Tell us about uh, what your transition was like. Yeah, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, sort of the last third of my uh, my active duty career, I transitioned to what they call the Acquisition Corps, which head, heads up a lot of the research and development, science and technology, program management of uh, systems that are being developed. Uh, that So that helped me sort of um, get used to interfacing with industry, understanding the way industry operates. Um, and then a lot of the program management skills that uh, are really, you know, key to making all that happen. And so that opened up a lot of contacts uh, with uh, with industry. And and I just happened to be here in the Huntsville area as I approached my retirement date. So it was really seamless. Uh, but but given how fortunate I was to make that transition, I, I love working with uh, with soldiers as they approach that transition. I spent a whole lot of time doing coaching on everything from resume development uh, to interviews and things like that, and uh, and some of the things that they need to be thinking about. And if I can engage them far enough out, maybe there are th certain things that they can pursue while they're on active duty, 
uh, to help make that transition a little, uh, little, little smoother. But Huntsville is a very uh, military, veteran, uh, friendly environment uh, from from a uh, com the industry side. So it's it's a great place to be. Let's talk a little bit about Army football uh, today. You know, we have a the season starting on Saturday with the Middle Tennessee game. Uh, what has it been like watching uh, college football? Uh, the conferences deciding whether they were going to play or they were not. Uh, the uh, Big Ten decided not to play in the Pac-12, but uh, the ACC led in, in, largely, they say, by Notre Dame. And then the, the SEC and the Big 12 decided to play. What has it been like uh, as you watch the decision making on whether on how to safely play college football during this COVID uh, pandemic? Yeah, I'll have to be honest. When, when I saw two of the, the the five Power Five schools make the decision to uh, not play this fall, I, I thought that would create some inertia that might sweep the the, the balance of uh, of college football. You know, definitely the, uh, the MAC followed suit in that, and um, um, you know, and again that that momentum. So it was encouraging when the SEC and, and others sort of dug their heels on and, um, uh, you know, held the line, so, so, so to speak. Um, so I, I've been encouraged, uh, I, you know, I think from a prag pragmatic, if I, if I sort of lay aside my passion for uh, college football in general and Army football specifically, uh, you know, you look at the typical college athlete and you're looking at a demographic uh, now that we've had months to analyze the data with regard to COVID, and that's one of the least risk, uh, at risk uh, demographics there are. They're in shape, uh, they're in the right age bracket, stuff like that. So I think it it was a, um, if you look cost benefit, risk uh, reward kind of thing, I think it was a good call by those uh, conferences as well as individual programs uh, to, to pursue that. And uh, so that, uh, college football passion hat on back on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited that we'll have uh, college football to watch. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that moves forward uh, from, from the standpoint, you know, what happens when a team gets a player uh, that comes up positive or a group of players and and uh, what kind of dynamics does that kick in? How, uh, and, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure West Point, uh, you know, sort of world-class institution about, you know, planning and preparation uh, have probably already got that decision matrix, what happens based on various events and, and those kind of things. Um, so hopefully uh, all the programs are doing what they can to mitigate those risks uh, and have a plan in place to uh, what happens when some of these less than optimum um, events kind of happen and how they respond and bring that into control so they can continue to, to play for the balance of the season. Yeah, we had a chance to sit in on the Board of Visitors meeting uh, about mm -hmm. a month ago and uh, Lieutenant General uh, Darrell Williams, the superintendent, gave a, gave a uh, thorough briefing to, uh, to, the, to the board on uh, the plans that were made to handle graduation and to handle our day and the different uh, training that the cadets would do over the summer. And he brought in, uh, you know, his team, it was uh, four or five colonels came in from different departments, Department of Systems Engineering, uh, a couple of uh, the medical departments about all the planning that they did. It was interesting, he said that um, they looked at the COVID rates in each of the 500 counties that the cadets came from. And they were tracking it down to that level. Plus they were taking army research from uh, Korea and Italy uh, as to what they had learned about treating and, and, and working uh, uh, to prevent COVID cases in those areas. So it's very impressive. So we know the same uh, meticulous nature is being applied to uh, the game on Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, there will not be spectators, but there will be the Corps of Cadets sitting on the uh, west side this year instead of the east side. And we understand the West Point Band is gonna play, but they're gonna play from the stands. Uh, this mm. year. Uh, so we're, we're very appreciative to be able to be there. Tell us about, uh, you've uh, obviously followed Coach Jeff Monk and his career at West Point, uh, the building years, and then the real uh, success years, uh, uh, beating Navy three times and winning two uh, Commander Chief trophies and the bowl game wins. 
What has it been like uh, watching what uh, Coach Jeff Munkin has brought to, to the program? Yeah, I, uh, I tell you, it's been exciting. Uh, as someone who is a member of a class, class of 84, uh, those, those were, uh, I, we, we finished out the lean years of, of, of Army football uh, in, in the mid 80s. Uh, Jim Young came on, uh, I think, my, my first year. And, um, um, but, but uh, against Navy, we were 0 3 and 1. Uh, so that, that those were tough times. I never got to experience a win against Navy uh, a, a, as a cadet. So to see the turnaround, and I, and I tell you what, I, I, I was, as when he got announced to look at his pedigree, uh, to look at the way he turned around a Georgia Southern program, um, and his impact is still being felt uh, within the program today. Uh, and, and just even from that uh, initial press conference, you just got the impression this guy gets it uh, because it's it's a challenge to coach it at the surface academies. Um, you know, it, it, everything from uh, the, the pool of recruits that, that can make it into the academy and survive in that environment is, is a smaller one. Uh, if, if, if uh, even with some of the changes about the service obligation and pursuing pro professional sports, it's still an uphill battle. And so I think that that turns some guys away, but I think he's done a great job on the recruiting front. More and more, we're winning some of those recruiting battles against our sister academies. Um, but I, yeah, yeah, when you know the uh, uh, when we had that first win in his tenure against uh, Navy, man, it was it, it was cloud nine, and to see that happen again on the heels of that, uh, that that was fantastic. And it's it's good even with last year being a little bit of a down year. Um, I still think we, we are firmly in a period where we're going to be competitive pretty much on every uh, given Saturday. Um, and the Commander in Chief's trophy is going to be in the mix. A bowl game is going to be in the mix. So now those are, have become those expectations and the challenge. You know, it's uh, I've heard a lot of people say it's one thing to succeed, but it's even tougher to su sustain that success. And I think that's the uh, the challenge before Coach Munkin and his staff. Well, we certainly see a lot of good young players in the program, and uh, I think one example of that is the uh, uh, the uh, starting center is going to be a sophomore, Connor uh, Bishop from uh, the Philadelphia area. We talked to him the other night. Very confident, 290 pounds, six to three. Uh, that was one of the things Coach Munkin likes is he wants his center to be pretty big. But he's also going to work with a young quarterback, uh, Christian Anderson, mm -hmm. uh, who's been in the program, played the Navy game, uh, handled that well. Uh, what have you guys on the Quad Addies uh, countdown to kickoff been uh, saying about uh, this year's team? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. About half the roster turned over, um, some some new faces on the offensive line, but it's encouraging. A lot of those that maybe weren't starters last year on the offensive line got some reps. Um, McCleary is a classic example of that. Matter of fact, going into the Navy game, he was the designated backup at both tackle positions. And that's that's tough. You know, you think about everything from mechanics and everything to blocking assignments. It's, you know, you might think, well, you can play one tackle, you can play the other ones. But footwork is exact I mean, mirror opposite uh, and, and those kind of things. I, I, I was also surprised about putting a, a yearling at center. I mean, that's, that's quite a testimony, not only to his physical ability to play the position, but oftentimes, you know, center, that's sort of the quarterback of the offensive line, potentially calling, blocking schemes and pointing things out, uh, making sure they're all on the same sheet of music. Uh, but with the, uh, the option-based offense, seeing that, uh, that offensive line, can they congeal as a unit? You know, uh, they've got to reach a place where they instinctively know what right and left are going to do at any given time at, on any given play. And so uh, with the compressed offseason, uh, that, that sort of presents some challenges. Uh, but I'm sure Munkin has uh, done all he could to, to, uh, to within the time constraints they have to get, to get those reps in. Well, uh, you know, I think, you know, Christian Anderson, I think we were fortunate with Jabari Laws. Uh, that, that, matter of fact, I was at the game when he uh, got that season-ending injury and subsequent surgery. Uh, but Christian Anderson is is an able, and, and if we 
If, if, if he's the quarterback that we ride throughout the season, I think he can uh, get it done. Um, the uh, slot back, um, I think we're a little bit leaner at slot back. Uh, Hobbs, I think Hobbs, Hobbs was exciting watching him in the open field. Uh, you know, he was sort of our number two, not sort of, was our number two receiver out of the backfield. Um, but I, I think him picking up the load at slot back, I, th I think he's going to have to have a, a good year for us to reach our, our, our potential. But I think Tyler being moved from quarterback to slot back is a testimony that it felt like they need some additional talent. And, and he's, uh, he's an exciting player uh, to watch. Receiving core, I think we, we may have the best receiving core uh, in the Munkin era. Uh, coming back, uh, young uh, Alston, uh, the, a plebe um, in, in the mix to start. Um, and then Roberts, who was uh, the, uh, the backup at both wide receiver positions going into the Navy game. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that influences potentially the, the mix, the run pass uh, ratio, if you will. Um, but I, th I think, uh, I mean, Munkin's clear. He's a run first guy and as it should be. That, that's our bread and butter, uh, grinding out the clock, all those kind of time of possession. That's going to be key to our success. Um, looking at the defensive side of the ball, I think, you know, we've got some some big hosses up front. And, and if they can get, do a good job of, of really uh, impacting the point of attack there, leaving the, the linebackers free uh, to maneuver to go to the ball, um, that, that's, that it could be exciting time on, on, on defense. And I think uh, looking at Middle Tennessee State, I think uh, um, – they're going to be a much better offense this year, uh, at least with the way I see it. Yeah. So they're going to have to bring their A game. Well, certainly uh, we had a chance to talk with Nick Stokes, who is uh, going to be the, the nose tackle, and Kobana Bonzu, who's going to be one of the tackles. And, uh, you know, looking at uh, key players and linebackers, Eric Smith really had a big year last year, over 80 tackles. Yeah. Yeah. Number two tackler. Absolutely. And then the question is, is how Amadeo West is. We talked to Coach Munka just last night about him. Uh, they think he's, he was going to be a spectacular player, but he's had three season ending injuries. And everybody's just hoping that he can have a healthy and productive season. Uh, but everyone says he's a very strong leader. Yeah, I, I think, you know, given the fact that he's had so ACL, um, Achilles tendon, torn bicep, you know, it, it's just, um, I, I've grieved for him. Because I remember when he came out of high school, he was highly touted. And that was, he was really the, the golden nugget of that recruiting class. And to see what he has struggled through ha has been tough to, to watch, knowing his passion for the game and wanting to be out there with his brothers on the field. But I think the fact that he, he doesn't have many games under his belt, and yet his, uh, his teammates, his classmates said that there's a guy I want to follow. Uh, I think that is an incredible testimony uh, to his chemistry with his teammates and to his leadership ability. So kudos to Amadeo. Okay. And uh, Steve, tell us, is there have a final thought for us about uh, the season opener against, against Middle Tennessee State and uh, this unprecedented season that's uh, – going to be a long one, 12 games for Army, but uh, a final thought about going into this season? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, uh, offensively, I think we'll get the yards and we'll get the points. Middle Tennessee had a, had a really poor uh, defense last year. They only have five returning uh, starters, so not a lot of cause that that's going to improve a great deal. Uh, but uh, but when, we, when our defense takes the field, I think we're going to be facing a solid, solid offense. O'Hare, uh, is a solid uh, dual threat, a true dual threat uh, quarterback. Uh, we seem to traditionally struggle against mobile quarterbacks. Um, they already had a solid running back platoon. Then they got two graduate uh, transfers, one from Florida State and then the other from West Virginia. So they've got a potent backfield. Um, and their offensive line, after overhauling it completely uh, last year, all five uh, starters are returning. And so they've got a cohesive, experienced offensive line. And so I think it's we've got to play Army football. We've got you know, uh, when we have the ball, eat up the clock, keep our defense uh, fresh and uh, keep our defense off uh, off the field as much as possible. 
And uh, so um, I think those are going to be the keys of the game. Um, but, yeah, I, th I think uh, we've got a good chance to come out with a season, season opening uh, uh, victory. Very good. We're going to look forward to watching that. And uh, Sons of America Legion Radio will be at Mikey Stadium on Saturday. Follow our coverage on our Facebook page, West Point Football Report, and on Twitter at Sons Legion Radio. And we're going to be on for the – we're planning to go on the air for the full warm-up period. As soon as the teams come out on the field at Mikey Stadium, probably about 12, 30, 12 15, 12, 30 for a 1.30 kickoff this time, uh, we'll be on the air and stick around. We always cover the national anthem at Mikey Stadium. Uh, performed by the West Point Band. Should be a great day. No spectators, but the West Point War Cadets will be there, and they'll be making an, an, a lot of noise right behind the Army bench. Oh, yeah. Well, Steve Kripe, a veteran of the United States Army, a class of 1984 graduate of West Point, now Deputy Director at SAIC down in Huntsville, Alabama, working on high-tech defense uh, initiatives. Great to talk with you today, and thank you for your service to our country from everybody at the American Legion. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Good to visit with you today. And this is Ken Kratzer for Sons of the American Legion Radio. We're based at Squadron 135 in White Plains, New York, representing the 2 million veterans of the American Legion. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you at Mikey Stadium on Saturday. Have a great day.